Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. What is the fate of the House of Saud? Its list of complaints against Washington, Riyadh's well-known protector, is long and getting longer. The Saudis are furious over Western dealings with Iran, disappointed that Obama didn't bomb Syria, and determined to export its radical form of Islam. And one of its only real friends in the region is Israel. Given all of this, can the House of Saud afford what it calls an independent foreign policy? To Crosstalk Saudi Arabia, I'm joined by my guest, Brian Becker in Washington. He is the national coordinator of the Answer Coalition. And in Nashville, we cross to Mark Levine. He is a senior fellow with the Truman National Security Project and a radio show host. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, Brian, is it time for Washington to tell Saudi Arabia to pound sand? Well, I think it's been long established that the U.S. government considers the Saudi government to be an indispensable ally, not its only ally, and perhaps now not its principal ally, but certainly an important one. Uh, Ronald Reagan made it clear more than 30 years ago that there would be, quote, no revolution in Saudi Arabia because the U.S. was just absolutely determined to keep the absolutist monarch. Uh, in power there, uh, not because they care so much about what's going on inside of Saudi Arabia, but because they consider it to be uh, essential as the, the main oil exporter in the world and a geostrategic ally. But of course, the Saudi government ha has other things to worry about. Principally, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unstable regime in the way Saudi society has been organized. It's a distorted society. And it fears uh, revolutions either from a secular opposition or, more importantly, from an Islamic opposition. And so, in that sense, uh, the Saudi government is always uh, pursuing a foreign policy and a domestic policy based on sort of existential fear that the regime's days, uh, although it seemed omnipotent a while ago, could in fact be numbered. That's a good point. Mark, the, are, the days are numbered for the House of Saudi. Are they a good bet for Washington? Uh, Thirty years ago, I understand. I agree with Brian. I mean, uh, unfortunately, that was the reality there. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of things have changed in the last 30 years. A lot of things have changed in the last two years. I would argue that in the Arab world, one of the most unstable uh, areas of the world, Saudi Arabia is one of the most stable. You look at almost any other Arab country, name it, yeah, Libya, yeah, Mark, Egypt, is Tunisia, it, is, is Syria, it stable and they're having of, their spring is, it, is it stable because of tyranny? Is that it, stability? Well, actually, there's less tyranny in Saudi Arabia than other countries. Look, I'm not saying that Saudi Arabia is some free and open place. Their treatment of women, obviously, is, is terrible there. Uh, but compared to Syria, where hundreds of thousands are being massacred by Iran and Hezbollah and the Syrian government and al-Qaeda moving in and Iraq and Libya and Tunisia, yes, Saudi Arabia is a beacon of stability compared to all the other instable places there. Okay, Brian, if I can go back to you. But, I mean, so, Sy Syria is unstable because of Saudi Arabia and it's exporting its jihadists. No, and, not because oh, yes, of Saudi Arabia. Oh, it's, that is so yeah, well documented. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, let me go to know, Brian. That is so well documented right now. And it's one of the reasons why I'm doing this program is because the U.S. is supporting people that are against its own national interests. Brian first, then we'll go to uh, Mark. Go ahead, Brian. You know, Mar Mark's comments are, are somewhat laughable, I would say. Re remember when Jimmy Carter stood next to the Shah of Iran in 1977 and said, Shah, you are an island of stability in a sea of turmoil. And the U.S. premised its foreign policy based on being connected uh, hip to joint with the, with the Shah at that time. That was two years before the government was overthrown by a popular people's revolution. Of course, Saudi Arabia has fomented civil war in Syria. It had a principle, a fundamental uh, desire to overthrow the Assad government, to create a Sunni, a Sunni government that would be backed by the Saudi uh, regime. Uh, it did this in, in concert with, the, with Qatar and others. Uh, it functioned as a proxy, of course, for the United States and Western, Western interests who had said Assad must go. But uh, uh, Saudi Arabia had its own independent national interests or perceived national interests, or the interests of the monarchy uh, that drove it to carry out civil war. Uh, the blood of the Syrian people is on the hands of the Saudi government. To, so to say that they're a, 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 this kind that's of just crazy. emblematic Assad of, of massacred stability, hundreds of thousands that's just blasphemy. Saudi Arabia. Okay, Mark, crazy. Mark, go ahead. This it's is crazy. cross talk. We're going to be fair. That's like blaming Mark. the United States for the Holocaust. Uh, look, look, the Syrian government has been massacring hundreds of thousands that, of people. That's just random. They, that's random. I've been what do you on mean? your show many times, Peter. 
For three or four years ago, I came on your show. It was a peaceful revolution. The Syrian government mowed them down in the streets. They take out innocent men, women, and children, shoot them down. They don't allow any humanitarian aid. So, what aid is the role in. of Look, the is What is the role of the Saudis? And Sunni. Mark, Mark, what's the role of the Saudis then? I'll tell you the role. Go ahead. There's been a long-time battle between Shia and Sunni Muslims. It's existed for a thousand years. It existed in the Iran-Iraq war. Saudi Arabia is leading the Sunnis. Iran is leading the Shias. In Syria, of course, you have a Sunni majority country ruled by a Shia Iranian-backed minority. So why that's should killing Washington be involved in all Saudi of this? Coming in Mark, to defend why should the Washington be backing the sectarian difference? Why. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. They should, they should be backing the peaceful rebels there, because, and, and doing it through a no-fly zone, by the way, not through arms. Because right now, it's all going to end up, frankly, being a no-fly zone is an Iranian active war. satellite there. Brian, jump in. You know what? It's an act of war. Brian, 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 Brian jump in. I think it's an I mean, act of Jens, war. Let's, Jens, let's be real. Talk let's over each other. Brian. Look, let's be real. Let's be real, if I could. A no-fly zone means you have to carry out... Uh, the U through the U.S. and NATO air forces, the ability to destroy the Syrian air defenses. Uh, a no-fly zone means the U.S. would, unlike what it's doing right now, which is preparing for another round of negotiations, be doing what the Saudis wanted them to do last summer, which is to further take that step towards a full-scale military engagement with the Syrian government and with its allies. Uh, a no-fly zone is not a peaceful alternative to war. It's a step towards war. It's an active step towards war. Uh, the Saudi Look, government is pursuing a policy. I know you don't give a damn about the hundreds policy, of thousands of people being of murdered. Hatred, That's fine. Not because of, but not please don't because call an act of war to stop those murders. All right, Jen, let's stay with Saudi Arabia that, here. That, Mark, I, Mark, I'm going to go to Mark now. You know, Mark, uh, okay, I'll take what you're saying at face value. You know, the Saudis are trying to protect uh, civilians. But they, they uh, backed Saddam in a war against Iran, where almost estimates say up to a million people. So you're saying that the Syrian Syrian blood's more valuable than Iranian blood. That's what you're saying because it doesn't make any sense no. to me. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is the Saudis and the Iranians are in a battle. It's the old Sunni Shia battle. You've got Egypt and Turkey involved as well. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia will get nuclear weapons. Then Turkey will get nuclear weapons. And Egypt will get nuclear weapons. Then Iraq will get nuclear weapons. Al Qaeda will get nuclear weapons. The entire regime will get nuclear weapons. The whole area will. Look, this is a battle for hegemony. There's no question about it. Okay. The Saudis okay. care maybe about that's the true. people because they're But Sunnis. maybe if I can go to the, Brian, the, the if I can, can go to Brian, the, maybe it would be better if the United States had a good relationship with Iran and get rid of the drop this uh, this uh, authority authoritarian, tyrannical regime called Saudi Arabia. Maybe it'd be a better bet. The, the U.S. government right now, by engaging even in the first step of negotiations with the Iranian government over its nuclear program, or really about the unfreezing uh, in a modest way of some of the sanctions, not most of them, against Iran, it raises the specter, both for Israel and for the Saudi government, that there could be, in fact, a shift in U.S. policy towards the Middle East. The specter of peace between the United States and Iran is something that creates horrors inside the, the bedrooms of the Saudi royal family because they realize if there was any sort of rapprochement or detente or accommodation between the U.S. And, and the Islamic Republic of Iran, the government, instead of, for instance, constantly and endlessly seeing it only from the, from the vantage point of regime change, if there was some sort of a, an accommodation, it would mean the Saudi monarchy's role from the vantage point of U.S. geostrategic, geostrategic interests would, would be less necessary. Saudi Arabia could start to drop out of the equation. Not fully. That's what the Israel fear as well. Uh, they see constant war tension, the threat of war as being very useful for them because it means they're more important for the empire, more important for the empire's hold oh on this resource-rich and geostrategically part of the world. Okay, Mark, I, go ahead, Mark, go ahead. I wish, I, I, I wish that people would stop playing risk. It pretend like it's some geopolitical game where you put an army here and you put an army there. I support the Iranian people who are against the regime. I support the Syrian people who are against the regime. I support the Saudi Arabian people. I think that each people needs a right to have their own destiny and not be forced by these tyrannical powers. Look, the Iranian government is, has no way relationship to the Iranian people. The Persian people are some of those pro-American, pro-Israeli people in the Middle East. That's not the problem. The problem you is a regime. You can't compare the Iranian and government the regime and the that Saudi government. Hezbollah 
Allah that's supporting the terrorism throughout. And look, I, the Saudi regime has its own tyranny. Women in Saudi Arabia are not treated well either. There's virtually no democracy in the Middle East except Turkey and okay, Israel. Right. I understand that. All right. But at the end right. of the day, Mark, well, for, you brought for, up you, know, you brought up you know, risk. I Mark, just have to Mark, say, Mark, you brought up the term risk, obvious reference to the game, but. If I go to Brian, that's yeah. exactly what Saudi Arabia is playing in the region. It's playing risk with its money and supporting yeah. all and, kinds and, of and crazy and groups. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, and also when the and Mark forgot to mention that when the people of Bahrain against rose up for that's democracy true. against the the. The, the royal monarchy, which houses and hosts the fifth fleet of the of the Pentagon, uh, the Saudis moved in, and the Saudis moved in with brutal force with its with its army. And, and why the did Washington they do that? Because the people are Shia and Saudi is that. Sunni. Mark, at the end of the day, it's every people it's, needs this, to have this, individual self-determination, whether Shia or Sunni. And a majority Shia country like Bahrain yeah. should be Shia. A majority Sunni country like Syria should well, be Sunni. May, and maybe basically, if we weren't this oh, geopolitical game oh, between oh, Iran and, then and Saudi Arabia, be, uh, okay, Brian. Russia, before we go, to, that, let me go to Brian so before the break. Go ahead, I mean, Brian. Before the break, go ahead. Go ahead. On, 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 Mark, on Mark's uh, premise, then America should be a Christian nation and a white nation because it's the majority nation. I mean, that's completely America opposed to any Christianity sort of to basic exist, yes. tenet of democracy or freedom. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to jump I mean, in here. The, the We're going to go to a short break. And my... after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Saudi Arabia. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing Saudi Arabia. Uh, Brian, if I can go back to you, in the beginning of the program, I mentioned that Saudi Arabia has given these uh, signs and signals that it may want to pursue its own independent foreign policy, whatever that may be. I mean, w without the United States and without Israel, even though they uh, publicly they're not allies, but in many, way, many ways they actually are allies, I mean, what can that mean for Saudi Arabia? Because I, I would agree with Mark on one point here, is that it sees everything through the sectarian division. And it, this is what's, and this is one of the things I'm critical of Washington is getting involved in something like that because the United States is just dro brought in as some kind of mercenary army to settle uh, uh, conflicts on the ground. First, Brian, then we go to Mark. Yes, let's let's first look at Saudi foreign policy based not on the Shiite Sunni division, even though that's a factor. The fundamental part of their foreign policy is based on their own estimation of what the regime needs in order to stay in power. Uh, it is a fragile regime. It, it is an absolutist monarchy. It has been in power for 80 years. It has never had an election. One third of all the people in Saudi Arabia are migrants. The Saudi population is dependent on migrant labor for work. Uh, that makes the regime completely unstable in its core, in its essence, in terms of its domestic policy in spite of its oil wealth. So what it did over the long term was function as a proxy, as a client for the United States. In the recent years, after the uh, onset of the so-called Arab Spring, the Saudi Arabias did pursue a more independent, aggressive foreign policy trying to carry out regime change uh, against others in the Middle East. But even when it did so, it did so with the United States, not against the United States. It's the United States and the Saudis had the same goal in Syria, which was to overthrow the Assad government. Now you see, because of a possible shift in the way the United States is approaching the Middle East, that Saudi Arabia fears isolation. They really cannot carry out an independent foreign policy because of the regime's limited strength and durability. It fears an Islamic revolution or a secular revolution. It fears isolation. And now, it's re now it looks as if it's primarily the ally of Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't look for a worse outcome for a regime in the Arab world. Mark replied to that because it does look like a Tel Aviv, Riyadh axis now developing. And there's been lots of sound and fury that they could collectively could attack Iran if the United States and Western powers continue their dialogue with Tehran. Go ahead. 
Well, first of all, I want to say I agree with the first part of what Brian had to say with regard to the fact that, yes, a third is, is migrant workers. Yes, they're paying off people with oil wealth. But the idea that Saudi Arabia is somehow a client state of the United States, I completely disagree with. They have independent interests that often coincide with the United States, and Saudi Arabia can pursue an independent foreign policy. If Iran, for example, were to get nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia would have nuclear weapons probably within a month because of their alliance with Pakistan. In fact, many people think that Pakistan got their nuclear weapons because of Saudi money. So if there is a nuclear arms race, Saudi Arabia will be, will be right there after Iran. It's one of the reasons why I support the current Iran deal, because I think it is the best chance we have to prevent this nuclear arms race from happening. But please don't pretend that Saudi Arabia somehow is There's, independent, uh, you know, somehow is a United oh, States it, client state. It, they're a very Mark, independent Mark, place. Has, they they Mark, are pursuing has, their own interests. Mark, and the this, fact that they're joining with Israel this, tells you that they're doing what they need to do to survive, not because they like Israel, but because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Okay, Brian, this has nothing to do with a nuclear Iran, does it? It has, what it's all about is a detente, possible detente, with Tehran in the, in the outside world to, to stop isolating it. This is the worst nightmare for Saudi Arabia and Israel since it's already been mentioned. It's not about a, a nuclear weapon. This is in, such in, a fiction. It's all about nuclear Indeed, weapons. No, it's not let's the go to Brian. Let me go to Brian. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the specter. Go ahead. It's not the specter of a nuclear-armed Iran. It's the specter of a peaceful accommodation between the U.S. and Iran. And that's the main danger for the Saudi government. That's how they perceive it. The Iranian government does not have a nuclear weapon. The Iranian government uh, has yeah. a, has, is the most inspected society. It has IAEA inspectors in there every day. It has now said that it won't enrich it uranium past 5%, only. meaning they, they it's impossible for it to acquire a nuclear weapon. In other words, there's nothing, and Iran has not because initiated a agreement. war with any of its neighbors. So it's not a nuclear-armed Iran, and it's not an aggressive wait, 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 Iran. Wait, wait. It's really the possibility of an if accommodation with Washington that scares Syrians, the Saudi monarchy. Please don't say it's not an aggressive war. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, it's, it's, it's to say that Iran's not an aggressive war when they're arming Hezbollah, which is murdering hundreds of thousands of Syrians, when they're arming war. Hamas. <laughs> Mark and Mark and it's Israel of course they have. and because of Israel's actions in Lebanon Hezbollah came into being okay we can go around and around on this here okay let's stay with Saudi Arabia here Brian what is the best case scenario about the future of the House of Saud because a lot of people would tend to agree with you it's a very unstable regime it has a lot of money and I would agree with Mark in uh, less than a month they can buy a nuclear weapon do, how do you feel about Riyadh having a nuclear weapon I'm more afraid of that than Iran well, having I, a weapon go ahead go ahead Brian I, I don't think they I don't think they can get a nuclear weapon. I don't think even though the Saudis helped finance the Pakistan nuclear arms project, it's not like the, the Pakistan military is gonna say, Oh, and here's your bomb, by the way. <laughs> I just don't see that happening. I think they I think the best case scenario for the Saudi family, the royal family, is there's no best case there. I think they can look back in history and see Louis the sixteenth or the Shah of Iran, all the other monarchs who uh, finally end up in the dustbin of history, and they know it. They know that they're days are numbered. And so all of this attempted appearance of, a, of, a, uh, of omniscience, all of this power of, of, of projecting an independent foreign policy, underneath it all, in spite of its vast wealth, in spite of its vast military, it's a fragile regime. It can be toppled. I think it will be toppled They're ultimately. They're all fragile. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Every government in that era... Every government in the Middle East, except Turkey and Israel, because they're democracies, every single other government is fragile. You look at a fairly stable country like Jordan, it is fragile as well. Uh, my hope for Saudi Arabia is to become a constitutional monarchy more like Jordan. But Saudi Arabia has lots of work to do. You're absolutely right. Its citizens have power, but its workers are not their citizens. Women have very few rights in Saudi Arabia. I'm not defending the Saudi regime, and I'm not saying that they're stable. I'm saying they're more stable than virtually every other regime in the Middle East, and that's not a compliment to Saudi Arabia, it's really an insult to all the instability in the Middle East because of this conflict, the, because the, the, of the, the Saudi, Saudi Saudi conflict, society, because of the dictatorship. Okay, Brian, jump in. No, the, the Saudi society is rotting from within. There's 12 percent unemployment amongst the they Saudi youth, the young people who have graduated. The, is the, it better two, in Yemen? Two million migrants have been... Two, 
Two million migrants have been deported in the last year. The society is now rife with, with extreme racism. Uh, the society, society knows that it's, it's, All true. it's, it's lost its moorings, that it has no ability. But the Saudi government has no solution because the only solution would include the liquidation of the monarchy, which the monarchy won't do for the but obvious reasons. you can't look reasons. at it in isolation. Okay, Mark. My point is this. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying no, Mark, about Saudi Arabia. No, Mark, I don't want to waste time Syria on that. I want to ask Egypt Mark a question. I want to ask yeah. Mark a question, okay? I mean, obviously, I think all three of us can agree on one thing, is that the so-called values of the, of the royal family of Saudi Arabia have nothing to do with anything that any of us would find in common whatsoever, okay? But there is a commonality there, Mark, you know, and it's called American arms. They love Saudi Arabia, don't they? And this is one of the things that they're, the Saudis are threatening the Americans. They... The, the, the arms makers in the U.S. have a lot of influence in Washington. This is what's keeping it together, at least for now. What do you think? Saudi Arabia does like American arms. The, the Egyptian dictatorship of Mubarak certainly liked American arms. There's no question about it. Yes, Bahrain does as well. Uh, we do arm dictators in the Middle East. I, I don't think anyone disputes that. My point is that Saudi Arabia is less dangerous than virtually all the others. That's no praise to Saudi Arabia. It's telling you it's, an, it's, it's, the, best, really it's the best apple That's really cold comfort to the people in Syria. Of That's really cold comfort to the people in Syria. But no, but Syria, you really. can't blame Saudi Arabia for Syria. That's really silly. I mean, when the people of Syria rose up not Violently, were mowed down by their government and tanks and mortars. Remember, Syria doesn't even allow the Red Cross to go in because they're massacring people day and night. Saudi Arabia has done many bad things, but if anything in okay, Syria, Mark, they're trying I'd like to, to go. To I'd like to go to Brian. You know I'll you know tell what? you one of the bad things that Saudi Arabia does. It sends its young people with tickets on airplanes and money in their pocket, and they go across the border with the acquiescence of the Turks. This is what they're doing for the Syrian people. This is the export of Saudi ideology in violence. Mark. Okay, Brian, which, jump which, in. Sorry. Well, I would Brian, just, I would jump in. This. Go ahead, oh. Brian. Yeah, so, so the, the Saudi... The, I mean, if you look at the past 35 years, the Saudi royal family has been a funnel through which oil money, but also CIA money, has gone to the most reactionary forces in South Central Asia, in Afghanistan, with Osama bin Laden, in Pakistan, and then to the same al-Qaeda forces uh, in Syria. The Saudi royal family, of course, does pursue its own policy. It has its own networks of support. They're very, very reactionary. They're very reactionary towards workers, towards unions, towards women, is towards Iran. all the things that people equate with freedom. Here, here's the and, and in the case of Saudi Arabia, by the way, Mark says, Mark says the Saudis are less of a threat. The question is to whom? Certainly not to the Syrians. If you go to Saudi Arabia, Mark, if you go there, you'll see wanted posters for migrant workers up in the they wall because they're enslaved in Saudi Arabia. people by the Saudi royal family. It's very threatening. It's threatening. It's very Brian, threatening I'm not for defending them. Saudi I mean, this Arabia. This is a society that's based on enslavement. Okay. It's based Mark, on feudalism Brian, and Saudi enslavement Arabia and, and Okay, Mark, go ahead. Mark, I'm going to ask you a Sa quick question. I'm going to ask Saudi Mark, Arabia. I'm going to give you the last word of the program because we're almost out of time and I'm going to give you the last word. So you prefer to have a cozy relationship with so Saudi Arabia and not have a detente with Iran. Go ahead, 40 seconds. I prefer neither. Saudi Arabia and Iran are both dictatorial regimes. They both arm terrorists. They're both engaged in the Sunni-Shia battle, and they're both destroying people throughout the Middle East. I think the people themselves should decide. That's why I support the Syrian rebels and the Bahrainian rebels. And, and throughout the Middle East, I support the Arab Spring because I think there is a third way between the two horrors of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Okay, Mark, let's keep in mind that people in Ir Iran go to elections on a regular basis, and there's a plurality no, they don't. They're parties. not allowed to vote for We've who they want. We've run out of time, the gentlemen. Yes, I want to thank yes, many yes, thanks indeed, to my guests in Washington and in Nashville. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstop Rules.